So today I'm going to be talking about four case studies in which we've used mobile either alone or as part of a mixed method. And I just want to walk through how we used it to address some of our clients' business questions. But I want to start with why. Why mobile qualitative? Um, first thing I'd like to ask is, Everybody in the room who has a smartphone on their, in their possession right now, can you raise your hand? Yep. That would be the first reason why mobile qualitative. Um, it is everywhere. And the statistics have just become staggeringly high. 77% of Americans have a mobile smartphone. And if you are between 18 and 29, 92% of you have smartphones. The only age group, and this is not a surprise to anybody, that has uh, a lower percentage is uh, seniors. And they're at 42, which I think is pretty remarkable. And smartphones have become a natural extension of people. They take selfies, they record themselves obsessively, they post on social media. So getting them involved in research using their smartphones is nothing new to them, nothing uncomfortable to them. And in fact, they welcome and seem to really enjoy participating. Um, the other reason why we should care is because, did I just, no, okay. Because with a mobile smartphone, we are seeing behaviors in the moment, on the go, and not in a single point in time. We are able to see, or a single location for that matter, we're able to see people's behaviors in home, in store, in car, anywhere that they are where your products or services are being used or sold. Um, and so that is my second reason. And my third reason is because behavior over time is something that qualitative researchers have struggled with. We've had people self-report, and we all know that there are flaws in self-reporting. Um, and we now are able to follow them over time. If you go into someone's home at a single point in time, we do get the context, and that's incredibly important. Um, but they are then telling us, here's what's happening in my life today, but I don't know what happened last week or next week, and I'm relying on them to tell me, and sometimes they don't remember, and sometimes they're not necessarily truthful. And so when we do a mixed method, we often do a mix of in-person ethnography and then mobile journals so that we can follow the same people, get the context, see where they live, what their life is like, and then follow them for a period of time. Um, so I also want to talk about the participants' point of view. I had indicated to you that it is something that is very much a part of them. It's an extension of them. We're not asking them to do anything that's unnatural, anything that's unfamiliar to them. So there are obvious advantages to harnessing their behavior. And so unlike Tom's five Cs and seven Cs, I apparently have six Cs. Um, and the first one is we are able to observe them in the real world um, and in a real world context. The second one is that we are, they are less apt to censor themselves or filter their opinions. We're not there with them. They are used to being unfiltered and uncensored in social media. And again, we benefit from that. They're very comfortable, as I've said several times. They're already doing this, so we're not asking them to do something that they don't do. They can arguably be less self-conscious when a researcher is not present. And we often get the kinds of feedback that I don't know whether we would get if we were sitting in their house with them or sitting across the table from them in a focus group facility. It's also more convenient for them they can participate anytime, anywhere, and um, there are no constraints on time or geography. So we can recruit people from all over the country to be participating in the same study at the same time, and they can be particip participating regardless of what the time frame is, um, where they're located. 
So I now want to go into the four case studies that I wanted to talk about. Each one of them is addressing a different business objective of our clients. Some of them were um, single method. Some of them were part of a mixed method, and I'll indicate that. Um, the first one I'm going to be talking about was um, white space opportunities in the prepared foods business. Um, our client was someone who manufactures prepared foods, and they wanted to understand how people made dinner choices, their everyday dinner choices. And so our method was to have them keep a mobile journal over the course of seven days where they showed and told us where they were planning, where they were shopping, where they were preparing, how they were serving, and we were really able to get in-depth insight from them about, so for example, with planning, what were the triggers? What made them think about dinner and what they were gonna make for dinner? We asked them to show us their pantry and their refrigerator and how that impacted what they were gonna have. Um, with shopping, we asked them to take photos during their shopping trips. We asked them to take photos of their shopping lists um, to indicate which were staples on the list, um, which were impulse buys that were in their cart. Um, we then were able to do what we call qualitative eye hutnographies, where we watched them um, preparing their dinner. And they were thinking out loud while they were preparing it. They sometimes had another member of the family filming them. Sometimes they just set their phone up um, on the table and we watched and we were able to see where their challenges were, what they were reaching for, what it seemed like they wished they had handy that they didn't. Um, and then we were able to um, observe them serving, getting feedback from their family members. What did the family members think about this meal that their parent decided to prepare for them? And we also ask them to do daily self-reflections, and we do this a lot with mobile because as they're tracking their behaviors over time, they begin to realize what some of their patterns and their triggers are, and they also learn something about themselves. The net net with this study is that we were able to identify different everyday dinner occasions that our client then used as a springboard for ideation of new product solutions. And I have a very short audio clip of people triggering. If it and I am thinking of dinner because my coworker heated up her lunch and it smelled so good. I don't know what I'm going to have for dinner because I have to go to the market after work. Tonight will be an impulsive meal once again. All right, what am I thinking about dinner? I'm thinking about dinner because I already, I always think about what I'm gonna fix for dinner at various parts of the day, and tonight we're gonna have meatloaf, and I'm thinking about my fact that my daughter has volleyball this evening, and I'm gonna have to get that meatloaf in and ready that we can eat all eat before she goes off to volleyball. Sitting, talking with my son at breakfast and letting him decide if I should thaw out chicken or steak for dinner. It's 12.30 in the morning, and we just got home from a date. I was looking for something to eat in the fridge and noticed I have two pounds of meat, hamburger meat, to cook. I think tomorrow I might cook taco meat and have tacos or nachos. Okay. One of the things that you'll notice um, not just what they were saying, but where they were and when they were saying it. We really get people engaged when we conduct these mobile journals. And one of our best practices is that we call them and personally engage with them prior to launching the journal with them so they know there's a human behind it, that we really care, that we're really interested, and that we would get them at 12.30 in the morning um, or at their office, um, I think speaks volumes about this method and what you can get. And the next study is really one of the more amazing studies that we have done. Our client in this case was the USDA, and they have asked me not to show any actual pictures of respondents or play any audio or video clips. Um, but this was to help them understand uh, the influences that cause low-income women to stop exclusively breastfeeding well short, in most cases, of the one-year recommended time. 
So we began with the phone briefing, as I mentioned earlier, and we recruited people to start this literally the day after they had had their baby, in some cases in the hospital. These were all first time moms, and we followed them for four to six weeks. It became a support group for these women. We had women crying um, during their mobile. They would do video, and we actually saw a whole lot of breastfeeding going on and a whole lot of breasts, which is part of why I can't play the video here. Um, but they, we, one woman was in tears talking about how she was afraid her child was not getting enough food. Um, another one was confessing how difficult it was and how much her life had changed, that she hadn't expected it. And really, we learned a lot about the challenges that they were facing, both emotionally and physically, um, their knowledge around breastfeeding, who was influencing them, either positively or negatively, who was encouraging them, who was discouraging them and um, the motivations that they had to continue or the reasons that they decided to stop. And also the USDA asked me not to share our findings. There is a year's clearance before we can actually do a full case study. But the insights that were gained from the study were used to feel the content for a social marketing campaign that has not yet launched. It was a fascinating study. As you can imagine, recruiting for it was tough. But it was, um, it was really, really rewarding. The third case study is Understanding Engineering Workflow. And our client was IEEE, who's the world's largest technical professional association. Um, they knew academic engineers very well. Um, but they did not know much about corporate engineers, and they really needed to understand what their information needs were and when in the workflow they needed them. And it was decided that sitting in focus groups and saying, tell me about your workflow, was not going to get them to the level of detail that they needed um, or to surface those subconscious, unmet needs. And so we asked them to participate in a three-day mobile journal, again, beginning with a um, pre-interview, and in this case, a post-interview. Um, and we were able to really observe their work behaviors. They would indicate when they wished they had information. We would see when they were accessing information and what it was and where they were getting it from. Um, and in order, because these were very busy professionals and we were afraid they might not be as compliant, we sent triggers to them four times a day. Think about the last couple hours if we haven't heard from you. What did you do? Um, and um, where in there was there an information need that wasn't being met? Our client has been using the information for this from, for months now. We identified and mapped a workflow. We identified five key information pain points and identified four distinct work styles and they created a target persona which is now hanging on their walls and, and they refer to it on a regular basis in prioritizing their new product offerings. And my final um, case study is um, an automotive path to purchase study. This was a single point in time. Um, we used the M4 mobile panel and I don't think they're here today, but these members of the mobile panel, the, the, all of the auto dealerships were geomapped. And when members of the mobile panel walked into a geomapped area, they were trigger, it triggered a short screening survey to determine whether they qualified. We were looking for people who were there to purchase a car and not service their car. But we were able then to ask them if they were interested in participating. We were then able to talk to them live immediately after their visit to the dealership and get a level of detail about the dealership experience that you don't normally get. They were there of their own volition. We didn't send them there. They didn't necessarily know they were going to participate in a market research study. And we got some really interesting and authentic feedback. This was part of a mixed method with the mobile being this single point in time. We also followed up with these people on an online bulletin board afterwards to go into more detail. Um, but they, with this particular study, they identified some really pivotal points where dealers were missing the mark, and they were able to help. Because Driving Sales, our client, is a training organization, they have been able to use this information to create training materials. 
Um, and just one quote. Oh, it didn't play. <laughs> the guy said, it's like a lion in a safari, I'm being stalked, and it was, it was classic. Um, I can see that I am running out of time, and this is the question we get. If you're sending people out um, and telling them to do all the work, why do you need us? And so I'm gonna very quickly go through this, because we need to create assignments that are going to optimize the output that we get from them. We need to provide guidelines for participation as well as keep them motivated and engaged. We need to build rapport and trust so they will play with us for seven days, four weeks, six weeks, however long. Um, we are constantly capturing, observing, and monitoring their responses to make sure that they're giving us what we need and that we can probe for accuracy and understanding. Um, we're keeping clients engaged with daily briefings. We're asking follow-up questions, and then we are reporting what it all means. So my, my sort of my final statement is that in closing, it offers a terrific opportunity to get up close and personal with your client, with your consumers, your customers. And if you haven't experienced mobile, I strongly encourage it.